Hi, everybody. It is episode 16. I am no longer ahead of myself, which is a big drag. Just I was one ahead, but then uh, I got complicated one night. I had to do it yesterday, so now I'm just, you know, the day by day. So 16 is recorded on 16. Um, I'm running low on guests. I have a couple guests planned for later in the week, but for right now, it's just going to be just me. For right now, it's just going to be just me. That's what I said, and that's how I'm saying it. Uh, first and foremost, <sighs> you hear that? That's clean nasals. That's uh, fresh nasal passages. I'm no longer sick, which is going to be super exciting for me. I'm going to, uh, yep, NyQuil and uh, a night off work, and I feel brand new, so that's fantastic. Um, you know, when it's by yourself, I've done a couple solo episodes, especially when I did What to Do in Your 22. I had like three. Yeah, I really kind of planned them out. You know what I mean? I took a lot of time to kind of formulate ideas, let them incubate, take notes on stuff, and uh, figure out where I was going to go. But um, it's harder to do that when you have to put out a podcast every day. So I'm going to riff for as long as I can on the ideas that are incubating at the moment. Um, At the forefront is kind of this whole, um, how do I say it? Two people recently, one in early December and one last night, have, it's the first time in a while I've gotten judgment for not being in college or having finished college. And that's okay. And originally last night, I'd kind of put the first one that happened early December to bed. But then last night, it kind of like stirred it up again when I got just uh, judged, I guess, right? And so I was going to come on here hot this morning off the cups of coffee and just, uh, I don't want to say fillet or roast these fools, but I really wanted to. I really wanted to, uh, I don't attack them. But if I attack them, then I'm just, you know what I mean? What am I doing? I'm attacking their life choices because, you know, it's like I'm trying to do like a tit for tat situation here and that just doesn't make sense. So... I guess more so what I wanted to do was just put it in perspective of like your choices are your choices, right? And sometimes I think we get caught up in this line of sight that has kind of been created by institutions to push you in a certain direction. And this is kind of a bigger, this is going to dive into bigger subjects, but like, you know, you're kind of told go to a school, go to college, get a job after you get the paper, and then so on and so forth, and get the ki- the girl, get the kid, get the house. And that American dream is fine if it's 1940. No, see, that's rude. It's fine still. But I think what happened was that the American dream did happen for a full two generations, and now not all the questions were answered. So I feel some people are looking for new answers and looking for more questions to ask. I think, not to toot my own horn or to put myself in anywhere, but I think I'm maybe one of those people trying an alternative route. Um, I'm not breaking any ground here. There are tons who've done it before me and tons who are doing it way better than I'm doing it now. Um, But I think it's a valuable... I think it's okay to do your own thing what I don't think it's okay to do is to pass on your path to another right (laughs) like giving a what what there's not you were just sitting down lying down there's nothing that's changed damn it dog um no so I think this the sin of it all the trouble of it all becomes when you take your path and try to fit or take somebody and think and pass judgment because your path's the best, there is no right path for everybody's different, right? Everybody, it's your experience. It's nobody else's. So giving advice or, you know, I'm just going to paint the story a little bit. I'll paint the early December one because it's more dramatic. Um, And by paint this picture, I mean just tell the story. I was in an Uber, 
and when I get into Ubers or cabs or whatever, I like to talk to the driver. I sit in the front seat. I like talking. Um, I like asking questions, uh, especially if they have an accent, because that means they're from somewhere else, which is cool. Um, like, how long you been driving for? How's your day going? Stuff like that. And then I ask where you're from, if they have an accent. And uh, I love that. So it's early December. I'm sitting in a car with an Uber driver, and I ask him where he's from, and he says, Pakistan. And I'm like, that's incredible. When would you come over, this, that, and the other? And he answers. And then it's a little bit longer of a ride, and he asks me what I'm doing. And then I tell him the things that I do. And it's not a, you know, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm happy with where I'm at, right? So I, I share with him, and he, I'm where I want to be right now. I'm not, you know, the future I'd like to be you know, better than this, but it doesn't matter. And he, he just immediately says, go back to school. Go back to school. And I'm like, uh, and instead of getting confrontational then, which I maybe should have, because maybe that would have put it to bed. And I'm not saying that confrontation is key to anything here, because it's not. It's not the way to go. But if you're choosing, there's two paths you can choose in this situation. It's confrontational or non-confrontational. If you decide to take the non-confrontational path like I did and just pivot back to him and ask him a bunch of questions, you don't get to hold on to that. You know what I mean? You should let it go because you've chosen to not confrontate. But instead, I've been fighting with this guy in my head for like a month and he doesn't even remember that I exist. So it's so silly. It's like I want to punch this dude in the mouth. And he doesn't even know I exist. And I'll admit, he was rude. And I know, you know what I mean? I'm not I'm not soft. I'm not hard either, but I'm not like tough is what I'm saying. But I know when somebody's being rude, and I can usually take it to some degree because of the service industry. I get a little bit of a thick skin from that. But I would be, I would be like, oh, why are you going to school? And he'd be like, oh, I'm going to be a pilot. I'm like, that's amazing. Have you always wanted to fly planes? And he's like, no, it pays a lot of money. And I'm like, oh, really? That's great. Um, What are you going to do with the money? And he's going to be like, I'm going to pay off my college debt. And I'm like, oh, okay. You already have debt? And he's like, yeah, because I, I was an accountant first. And I'm like, oh, so you finished and now you're switching majors? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's cool. Um, Good for you. And he's like, yeah, go back to school. And I'm like do you have kids? Are you married? He's like, yeah, I got two kids. Go back to school. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm going to get out of the car and I'm here now. So bye. Thank you for the ride. And he says, go back to school. And I wanted to say, oh, you convinced me, Mr. Uber driver, but I didn't. I said, thank you. Have a good day. And if I would have maybe said something mean I don't think I'd have let go of this either because I'd probably be like, ah, I was a dick. Or maybe I would have thought I won. I don't really know. Um, but in the world of complaining, in the world of choices, you have two options. You have confrontational, which is a fine option if need be. You stand If you want to stand your ground and you so choose to, choose to do so, by all means. Just, I mean, don't hurt anybody, you know. But if you want to need to be, yeah, by all means, kick some ass. And then, or if you're going to choose non-confrontational, if you're going to choose the road of the path, pacifist, 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 I don't know how to say it, um, then stick to your guns and choose that road and let that shit go. It's so hard, though. It's like, all I want to do is see that dude again. I even tipped him. I gave him a tip. Gave him like two bucks because I was like, I gotta help him pay his college debt, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> see, that's mean. A little mean. A little jaded. A little petty. Um, but it's just interesting that there's so many kind of like unwritten, written ideas of what we're all supposed to be doing. And... As soon as somebody steps out the line, for some people, it's such a big step. But for other people, they're like, oh, good for you. You know what I mean? And those people are just are either silently judging you, which is fine, or they're 
they really don't care about what you do because it is what you do. It is not what they do or it is not what they did. It has nothing to do with them. As long as you seem happy, they are happy for you, which is great. Um, so another interesting world of that is, and it's kind of like an inclusive, exclusive world, right? Like as soon as you're in it, you're exclusive to the rest of the world is um, like pop culture, right? Like Supreme or I watched these documentaries, which is kind of what started all this is like a... Um, it was called The Price of Everything. Um, it was on HBO. It's awesome. It's very cool. It's about the fine art world and the modern art world and how all of a sudden a p- person like Jeff Koontz who does these um, kind of Andy Warhol-like sculptures and they're Andy Warhol-like sculptures in the sense that they're mass-produced. And Andy Warhol didn't even create, you know what I mean, most of his mass productions. He had like a factory of people working and just making prints because that's all they were. And Jeff Koontz has the same thing. He just has people in his office making these, or in his factory making these bunnies and these blow-up animals. So what he did is he blew up um, animals out of like um, balloons, balloon animals, and then he casts them in metal. So they become these very shiny, very interesting sculptures. And they are cool, but... They're very Supreme esque. You know what I mean? If I would say if Supreme was art, that would be what it would be. Because Supreme's definitely not art. And it's kind of the idea of like taking and he even did a collab with Louis Vuitton. So Louis Vuitton has the L V in that classic print. And all he did was he stuck his bunny in between the print and he sold a bunch of them. And that's really what Andy Warhol did too. And I might be stepping out of my bounds here by talking about art like I know anything and I don't. But Andy Warhol took the Campbell's soup can, he changed the colors on it, and he changed how you interacted with it, and he changed how it was, um, it was seen by the world, perceived by the world, and he did it over and over and over again. Now the first time you do it, it's art. And I fully agree. But after that, it's money. And again, might be talking out of my bridges here because I don't know anything because I'm just little old me. But there's something to be said for that. You become a brand, right? So it's no longer I'm buying this piece of art that I loved. It's, oh, I'm buying an Andy Warhol. Oh, I'm buying a Jeff Koontz. Oh, I'm buying a Supreme shirt. It's not because I want it. It's because I want to be in the club. You know what I mean? I want somebody to walk in to my, you know, New York Chateau apartment and see my bunny um, portrayed, you know, out in front of the living room, in front of the veranda, or whatever it may be. And same with Supreme. I want to walk into the bar wearing this shirt because it is, puts me in a club, puts it, if I, if I buy it, which I can, The barrier to entry is obviously different for a $2 million art piece versus a t-shirt that can sell up to $300 resale. So, you know, kind of crazy. But it's all about this idea of who puts value to things and who we allow to put value onto things, right? So somebody's put value, a lot of, I guess, society has put value on going to college. Society has put value on Supreme. So society has put value to Jeff Koontz. But as soon as society decides to give away its attention to somebody else, as soon as the new Jeff Koontz comes, as soon as the new uh, you know, realm of education comes, as soon as you know the, the paradigm shifts, those people are left high and dry, hanging with nothing. And, or the bubble bursts. It's a bubble. Really, it's like the housing market, but the only difference now is that, and it's and it's interesting, or at least maybe I just don't know about two thousand eight enough about the housing market. The movie, I guess, the best example I have is the movie Get Short. Get Short portrays the housing crisis like nobody knew really what was happening, except for a very small group of people. Nobody really understood that this was about to happen. 
with Supreme and the art world, however, everybody knows. They're all talking about it. They're all talking, oh, this is a bubble. This will end. This will end eventually. And if something is self-aware, would it allow for its own destruction? Do you know what I'm saying? If you knew something was going to happen, wouldn't you just not let it happen? Because all a bubble is is attention, right? Um, you know, as soon as there's no, there's not going to be another supreme. You know, there's going to be supreme knockoffs. They can mess it up now that they are owned by a new company because they'll add too much to the market, right? Like the biggest fear of a supreme, I would assume, is that they end up in like a Walmart or like a Target or like a Nordstrom's because supply and demand have equaled out, right? Because right now there's so much more supply than there is demand that you can resell the hoodie for $400 or $500 or whatever it is. And the balance is skewed, you know what I mean? But as long as you're aware of that, I think you can keep that fire going forever, right? Unless there's not another 13-year-old who gets hooked on Supreme, but I doubt that'll happen. Because it's just the way of the world. It's just the cycle that's happened. I remember when I first heard about Supreme. I remember when I first heard about Jordans and all that stuff. I was like 16. And that's exactly who their market is. It's 16-year-olds who... And then, of course, there's 20-year-olds and everything who still wear it. Now it's in the rap culture and stuff like that. But really, it's for teenagers, you know? And if I watched... um a complex interview by Bobby Hundreds, uh, who does the Hundreds, and he even says, like, the further I get away from 16, the harder it is for me to connect with my market because I know there's a 16-year-old out there who will find me for the first time. And as soon as he does, it's game on. And I'm like, oh, that's fascinating. He knows he's marketing to 16-year-olds. I wonder if all of streetwear is marketing to 16-year-olds. And, uh, hey, stop barking. Hey, stop it. I'm trying to do something here, you selfish dog. Um, no, it's not selfish. I'm just trying to do my thing. I got to do my thing and have the dog in the room. So where I'm going is that uh, I'm painting things. I'm painting pictures that you guys probably were all already aware of. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought, unfortunately. I'm almost at 20 minutes. Um, Hold on, let me see. If I can find it here. There it is. So when you're giving your attention to something, if you're giving your attention to, for example, Soldier Boy. Soldier Boy went on the Breakfast Club this week and blew up. He said he taught Drake everything he knew. He said he taught Kanye everything he knew. He said, please stop. Please. Please stop. Soldier Boy right now is biting for attention. He's trying to get the eyes on him because then he can he can survive in this ecosystem for a little bit longer. And I think that's really what we're all trying to do is we're all just trying to stay in the system or at least that realm of culture is trying to... like It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know what I mean? It's like if I can just do this, if I can do that, if I can drop this, you know what I mean? I'll start this beef and then I'll drop this single and then maybe I'll have a couple couple months, a couple quarters you know, in the green, and then quarter three, or P3 happens, and uh, I'm in the red again, but I'll just do something, I'll stir up a new fancy stock idea, another option, and just keep the attention moving, and it's kind of a crazy thing to think about, that if you give your attention to the people who are, there's three types of people in the world, there's seers, and then there's people who are shown, and then there's people who don't see at all. Are the showers the people who are deciding these things? I don't know. I think that there is... So that's a saying that I heard from the price of everything. The price of anything. But now I think there might be four types of seers, right? There's people who see, and then there's people who are seeing the seers. And then they become the showers, right? Show me what is cool. 
Kylie Jenner, please show me what is cool, right? And then there's the people who don't see. Out of the three, right now, you know, you'd think you'd want to be the seer, right? You'd see the future. You know, you can tell the trends that are going to happen. You're the four, you're the tip of the spear. Or there's the non-seer. And something about the non-seer seems pretty blissful, if you ask me. And that's a wrap. So I'm sorry if that got incoherent or incohesive. I am liking trying to do these stream of conscious things. Um, I find it's an excellent test in thought and to see if I can just keep them going. Um, the podcast is up. Again, couldn't be happier with, um, you know, today's 16. So I have 15 days left in January, and that's pretty amazing more than halfway there. All right. See you later. See you tomorrow. Bye. Love ya.